Hello. Well, thank you for interviewing us. <laughs> Five minutes, so um, let's see. So until 10:35, hopefully we'll be finished by then. We have co-op questions. Um, Connie or I may have a follow-up question from your written comments or your wit your written answers, the supplemental questions or the uh, answers that you provide today, and then we each have one question that we're asking each of the candidates that we didn't disclosed beforehand. So uh, anyway, Connie will ask. Before you get started, yes. let me apologize Randall Johnson. for um, when I submitted the application, I was switching my computer from Windows 8.1 to 10. And when that happened, it was when I was putting everything together. So you notice I was, my illegible handwriting came into play because I just could get it right over the weekend. So, yeah. so yeah, I just want to state that I'm, I'm normally a little bit better off and a little more computer literate than that. However, uh, <laughs> that, things like that happen. So, uh, okay, yep, sorry. Um, well, and the questions we're going to ask too, we have to ask of everyone. So even if you yes. include some of these answers in your five minutes, um, we'll be repeating a question to you as we go through the list. Right. So um, number one would be, what would be your message if you were out on the campaign trail? And if you could let us know in five minutes or less. In five minutes or less. Mm -hmm. Okay, I w we'll try in five minutes or less. First of all, some people have come back to me and said, are you crazy to even look at that? And then I thought about it and I thought, let me see, I just came from a meeting today dealing with SARC and the YMCA, and one would probably argue that maybe that was also a crazy thing. So one has to care about the community, first of all, and that's probably the most important thing. I mean, why else would I be involved in things like that? At least that's my feeling anyway. I've been and have cared about economic development here on the North Peninsula ever since I was here, which was 30 years ago when we first began. And uh, I've been involved, obviously, in the Economic Development Council and many other nonprofit kinds of entities, including the Chamber of Commerce, on and on. And all of it relates to another story. You know, kids, when they graduate from high school here, they say, gosh, I'm going to go away to college and I'll never come back. I'm looking at someone I know who has come back, but that's beside the point. Um, and that's great. And then about age 30 or 35, they say, oh, I'd like to come back. What kinds of jobs do we have here? And guess what? You know, we're lacking jobs of certain types that, that we have. And the job is not just the job, it's also the job for the significant other that comes with it. So we are missing that kind of, of, uh, of uh, activity relative to the jobs. And that's always been very important. Um, so I and I, so again, I care about the economic health and the vitality of our area. Um, the port commissioner job is a valuable part of this equation because it's able to leverage port assets. I and you will see um, later, and I've certainly put my letter. Uh, a deep water harbor with waterfront. There just aren't many places like that in the whole state, and for that matter, the whole country, any place. And that just has to rise right to the tip top of one of the things we have. And there are a lot of other port assets. Of equal importance, I, I think, uh, obviously, having an executive director here and, and the whole staff all working together. And I will say again, you know, and I you have seen the Economic Development Council. So many times this area seems to go in their own little disparate ways where this little group has this meeting and they only meet there and we don't meet with anyone else. This other group meets over here. And having us all work together has been my mantra, as you have heard me say many, many years, because I think it's the most important thing we have. You know, when we try to make something happen, if we're not all rowing, and my favorite saying is we all need to be in that canoe rowing in the same direction or else nothing good happens. And so, uh, I shouldn't say nothing good, but it's very difficult for things to happen. And, and so I believe that uh, all along the way. Uh, it's also vitally important when we come to other things, when we, the, as a public entity, you have a voice that's sometimes missed 
you know, uh, when I go and show up to testify, like in front of the Department of Natural Resources, they will pay attention to you as, as the court, where they won't pay attention sometimes to me. Oh, well, he's just a timber guy over here. And, and so, and yet, when you look at, like, sustained harvest levels, it's so important to have those on a continuing basis and understood by everyone, particularly if we're trying to track a, a business like cross-laminated timber or any of those other kinds of things. So, you know, and, and that's just vitally important. Um, necessity of an airline. Been one of my hot buttons here for quite a while. Certainly one of the, the key items of the, of the port. It, it's just so important and, and <clears throat> there are obvious things for those of us that travel to the East Coast for business. All you have to do is get up at 4 a.m. and get stuck in Tacoma and spend an hour and a half and then think you're going to miss your flight to recognize what a pain in the rear it is to even be here to, you know, and we've kept our business here. But I'll be honest, even my board who flies in from outside, most of them, they come here and say, why in the hell are we meeting in Port Angeles? We should be meeting in Seattle. I can just fly in, have the meetings, hop on a plane and get out. We need a plane here in the worst way. Now the added benefit, of course, is if we have that is from a tourism standpoint, you have a whole lot of other things. And we certainly have had hotels talking to us, talking to all of you, not to me, about the potential of moving here if we get an airline. Gee, there's another benefit lo and behold, but sometimes people don't connect all those dots, you know, here's one thing, but it really reflects on a whole bunch of other activities that will take place, so anyway, another thing very important, obviously I mentioned the harvest levels, on, on a kind of negative standpoint, and I'll just say, uh, looking at the documents, and you are all so much more knowledgeable than I am, about things like the harbor cleanup, and you, noti you should notice that I mentioned that, well, why? I obviously, not unlike the port, was sued by Waste Action Management Project, so we all understand what happens there, so that's one thing. But more importantly, I was involved in the Superfund site on the East Coast here for the last four years, and I just know the owner's nature, and it has nothing to do with you having liability, it has a lot to do with who is the person around it we might be able to, to ensconce into the whole issue that we have, and again, that's just something that takes a lot of time and work and effort by a whole bunch of folks and very knowledgeable staff and everyone else. So, you know, and, I, and again, I, I think that I can add some benefits there just because I've been through a lot of things related to that. Um, am I running over? A little bit. Uh, okay, and just quickly I'll mention fiscal integrity. Obviously, I've been through the recession as a company, and we're still in business, lo and behold. Been with the YMCA, and believe me, we had some tough times there, but you just have to be able to watch your checkbook and make sure that everything's covered and that you have reserves in the appropriate place, which it appears the, the board does, et cetera, et cetera. So um, anyway, thank you for the first five minutes. Sorry I went over That's okay. Uh, number two, what port lines of business do you best understand and which ones are new to you? Um, <laughs> let's start with the new ones. Uh, marinas, I don't know. I would tell you that. Um, and I'm not in the boating thing. I don't really understand how, uh, I assume that comparable rates are looked at in other places to arrive at that and, and a whole bunch of other things. Don't know that. Don't understand lease terms. I don't misunderstand. I, I lease properties myself for for uh, one of our businesses all the time, big offices. But so there are a lot of ins and outs. I don't know. Don't quite understand all the costs involved and everything else. So that's one of the things. The other thing is I, I obviously wharfage and relative the timber business. I, I have a very good understanding because we've certainly been in that business and have utilized port services relative to uh, topside repair and things don't know if i really quite understand that very well at all um, um not sure how that comes together yet you know and being quite honest I until even if i thought i understood some things until one sits down in my opinion with the key staff person and goes through a budget understands the assumptions understands everything else involved with what's going on i don't 
think me looking from outside can tell you exactly <laughs> what is going on in a lot of areas. So, you know, I, I just know, you know, out of assumptions flow everything else. I'd like to know what assumptions are, you know, a simple thing is as simple as a lease, you know. I mean, once you understand that, you say, oh, well, now I understand and we can go forward. So, anyway, so those are the... <coughs> Thank you. Tell us about the opportunities and challenges that you see for two of the port's lines of business. Um, opportunities, I, I mentioned already, I, I believe that the, uh, the whole uh, waterfront has the opportunity to be one of the key uh, long-term money-making entities or parts to this the port. You know and to the benefit of all of us here in Cologne County. I, I just uh, continue to see that as being, like I said, they just aren't, they're not making any more port space anyplace, and I can't see it going any other way. Um, um, excuse me, I'm going to put on my glasses. Um, and I also mentioned the other opportunity, which I think is vital to our area, which is the whole airport airline coming in that that's a um, goes without saying and you've already heard me ex expound upon that what what I think is uh, 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 going to be a difficulty being quite honest are, are timber exports uh, and that I say that just because I've been looking at some of our forecasts and why is that uh, not much anyone here in the port can do about it if you look at the Canadian dollar it's what 73 cents big issue and so you're competing with already subsidized stub, stump beach up there, part A, part B, uh, you know, US dollar, Canadian dollar selling to the same market, same primary, co uh, you know, product that we're making, that's going to be an issue uh, or I think it's going to continue to be an issue. Um, and then the challenge, I always mentioned the, the issue, I think, in the, uh, the whole port clean up issue. So, um. Okay. Uh, number four. Do you see a curtain weakness in the way the port operates? And if so, what would you do to change it? I, I thought about that long and hard and um, I will tell you, having looked at many businesses to acquire and whatever, to, as you look on the outside, you do not know. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you that. Once I sit with people and go through financials and understand all the ins and outs of everything going on, I, I normally have a very good feeling but I about what seems to be right or wrong, but I, I will be quite honest, I sitting here looking from outside in, I, I could tell you, oh, gee, this is right and this isn't, but I'll be honest, I couldn't, I don't believe I'd really have a fact base to, to, to judge that on. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. What do you consider to be the most challenging aspect when dealing with the public? <laughs> um, there, there are two issues when you list, listen to the public, and, and, and by the way, that happens when you're talking to almost anyone. Sometimes we have emotions, and sometimes we're fact-based. And certainly when you have the public, uh, many times it's a very emotional thing, and I understand emotions, we all have them, uh, you know, and that's what they base it on, and that's certainly a, a, a one of many things to base, base things on. Uh, I try to operate from facts, <laughs> you know, and out of that we can have disagreements, but at least you have a, a, a playing field we all understand, so. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you see as, what do you see as customer service policies and goals for our stakeholders and tenants? You know, I, uh, just having spent, just as background for, for both of you, uh, the last three days visiting with all my customers in the sand and gravel business. And you think that's a pretty simple business, right? So why do you go to visit your customers, heaven forbid, and or tenants or whatever? Is because are we providing you a satisfactory product? Is it on a timely basis? What are your plans in the future? Are you looking to expand or not expand? And all those other good things. And if you don't have that contact with them on a periodic basis, you don't know. I mean, and uh, 
or you think you know, but I'll tell you, nothing like sitting down with someone to, to have that discussion. And, and they let you know right away. <laughs> and sometimes it's good news, like we need to expand, or sometimes it's bad news, <laughs> like you're not doing this right, and by the way, <laughs> by the time it gets to, to a critical stage, that's not when you need to handle it. You need to be on top of what your customers are doing all the time. So, And the port has quite a few customers, obviously. Thank you. <clears throat> what policy and procedure topics would you be most interested in exploring if you were appointed? Um, first, I don't know what, what you meant by policy and procedure. Obviously, I, there are some questions I had when I, I looked at, at, I guess, their policies, but the whole issue, obviously, of, uh, of, of, in your plan, you know, talking about acquisition of property, that may make sense, I don't know, need to understand. Uh, we certainly have the whole issue of sale and or lease of property on the waterfront. That's certainly an issue that sir, I've heard people bring up. Uh, and so, and lease basis, again, I just don't know. All those things one would have to be very involved in. Um, obviously, in the case of uh, timber resources, I would certainly and continue to be highly interested because it matters to our, our uh, uh, economy here. The port reserves, I looked at them, first of all, they looked, the fact that you have reserves is a wonderful thing, I should say, compared to a lot of entities in this world, um, but I don't know how they arrived at or does that really make sense or not, so there's, I, all I can tell you is I have a lot of questions. Okay. What is your experience in finance and understanding of financial documents? Oh, uh, gee. <laughs> So I, I live in the world of financial documents. Uh, let's start first on the lending side. Obviously, um, until this coming Monday, when I will no longer be president and CEO, I, um, we've negotiated loan documents with MetLife, for, uh, with Northwest Farm Credit, with uh, New England Farm Credit, with several leasing entities and Bank of America, including letters of credit, X and financing potential, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's on the financial side. Relative to reading financial documents, that was my background doing financial analysis of projects and things when I first began and, and got involved in many, many other things. And, and so, uh, you know, whether we're doing a discounted cash flow or a net present value or whatever you want to talk about, no, no big deal there. Relative to understanding balance sheets and P&L, if you give me a while, of course, you still always have to take a close look at the assumptions involved in anything, but uh, we, we run budgets for, what, nine different companies right now, so I'm fairly familiar with what goes into that. So, mm -hmm. I, What I would tell you is out of assumptions flow everything else, and if you don't spend time on the assumptions going into the budget, you don't, you don't understand, really. So, uh, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Do you have enough time available for court meetings and other community obligations? That's probably, obviously, if you looked at my letter and background, that was a big issue. We're in a transition, as I stated before, with, uh, or I'm in transition with Tyler Crows, about to become, as I said on Monday, the present CEO. Uh, between now and June, I have one trip to the East Coast to visit Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire and our operations there and all the areas that we operate in and I'll be gone about a week and a half that's one time there I think I I looked at potential conflicts and I didn't know exactly what the dates were I'll be gone four Mondays between now and the end of June just so everyone knows after that not so much I'm resigning my membership in the Board of Trustees for WFTA and Tyler's about to take over. I'm resigning a couple other things because he's about to take over. This is all wonderful. But again, when this whole opportunity came up, I was not thinking about <laughs> you know, applying or being there. And so I put those motions in the plan, into our plan uh, at Green Crow at the beginning of the year. So, um, and, and there's certain periods I can meet with people and certain times I can't. Now, I've been able to flex already looking at things about meeting with the president of Port Blakely. That's all right. I can move. We can move to another date and do whatever and so on and so forth. But uh, anyway. Ken, how should the Port Commission interface with other public agencies and organizations? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
and I'll be quite honest, I don't know how you interface with all the different organizations right now. I, I get to see some of the organizations only because of the Economic Development Council, because we all show up. I, I believe the discussion items, and I can only relate from that uh, with the different entities, uh, conversation, understanding, you know, being clear about what each one's doing, you know, that takes time, takes discussion, takes uh, ability to, to uh, convey whatever messages we're working on. So I, you know, I don't know of any other way to do that, really. So. Okay, thank you. Thinking back to past life experiences when you made an important decision, tell us about a decision you made that you later regretted, and what did you learn from that experience? Um, I'll give you two, but I, I also have to relate to the fact that I, I met with the, when we were interviewing for the person to take over and outside candidates and so on. And one of the people we were meeting with was a fairly high executive in a timber company, as you can imagine. But I asked him basically the same question. Had he ever made a mistake? What was the biggest mistake he had ever made? And he sat there for about 30 seconds and said, you know, I've never made a mistake. And I thought about it later, and I asked, and then I decided, well, you know, either the person above him or the person below him made a mistake. He never made a mistake. So <laughs> I can tell you I've made many. <laughs> and so two real quick things. One, which you're going to do when you get here, when I hired someone for a key management position, I thought I knew him, but I didn't check their references, you know. And I, as I told Holly, I should have, and it had nothing to do with their intelligence level or anything else that had to do with fit fit in the organization. And it was just a, a, a terrible mistake. Another probably recent mistake, which is very ap appropriate for this area, is we bought a bankrupt, we bought a bankrupt uh, mill here, put time into it. Uh, we based it on two things, based it on, first of all, a sustainable timber supply here coming from the State Department of Natural Resources, pretty important. We're a very specialized product, a big, big kind of deal, not it was, you know, a, a 20, 25 million dollar kind of sales then, so it wasn't from initially large, but not small, special niche, right? Um, so it's based on that. It's also based on the fact that if we remember where the Canadian dollar has been recently, and it was, you know, fairly close to par, so there we go. So two things happen, if the supply doesn't continue, that's a real issue. And it is a real issue, because then you have to supply yourself out of Oregon or wherever. And B, even though you've made all the improvements that you should think, you've computerized everything, you've done all the other things, you've increased your productivity by two and a half with the same number of people, you've lowered your unit cost by 50%, which is only 30% of the total. And even with the, in a very good workforce, you know, who, who pass drug tests, do all those other things. Even with all those good things, overcoming a Canadian dollar at 70 cents or 75 cents, good luck. You could be the most efficient operator in the world. You could have a really good customer. You can't overcome some things. And so there's an example of a not wonderful decision when I look at the, the dollars we invested, and more importantly, the time and effort of all the employees. And, you know, um, those things happen. Okay, number 12. What do you wish to accomplish during this appointed term as a, point, uh, as a port commissioner? Um, first of all, what do you, if it's a we, if we should get there. I mean, and I, it has to be a we. <laughs> it's the entire port team. And, and I just listed quickly, I, you, you know one of my hot buttons is an airline already for a whole lot. I want, I, or I believe that we have the opportunity on the waterfront development standpoint. We need to continue to be fiscally strong and we need an executive director. And that's in the next two years. Mm -hmm. That's pretty ambitious, right? <laughs> but. <laughs> Follow, do you have follow-up questions? Follow okay. okay. Do you? Um, let's see. I think 
I have I have a question that I asked the last candidate that I'll apply here. But okay. I, don't, I think it doesn't always follow up. So okay. <clears throat> so we have a, just a couple of questions that we're asking each of the candidates that are not on the list. <clears throat> the questions are not on the list. Candidates are. <laughs> Historically, the log business has been the port's bread and butter for its operating revenue. What do you see as the future for this line of business and for timber products? Um, so we, we need to dissect that. The, the, certainly in the case of log exports, if I look at it, you know, let's look at the macro part of the world, so, and, and without going too much into detail. If you look at what's happening, there are a lot of things changing, as they always do. I mean, I just mentioned currencies, and that always affects it. But when you get to the raw material, there are a couple things happen. The Russians used to have a whole bunch that came into China. That's basically stopped up, and of course they don't reforest, don't do anything, and they have incrementally very high cost things in the middle of Siberia. The Chinese will continue to have a wood demand, will continue to grow, and they're not going to be able to sustain it with their forests. So we need to know, what, however that's applied, whether it be raw logs or whether it be in, in products. You know, but in both cases, that, that will happen. The case of the Kiwis or the New Zealanders, they basically are a large supply, but they're basically at the limit, and they aren't continuing to, to uh, uh, reforest even to continue where they are now. So you look at that. And the Canadians have this thing called that, that strange beetle up there that's killed all that timber. And their total harvest is going to drop by almost 30 million. That's more than all New Zealand produces, 30 million cubic meters in the next 10 years. And you've already seen some issues when it goes into their sawmills where we've had explosions and people have died because of that. So, so you have all these. So do I think wood, demand, wood will continue to have a great demand? It will. And please remember, we in the U.S. still import 30% of our total lumber demand. So kind of a macro look at, at what happens in the world with timber, and it flows every place. And by the way, people like Australia can't supply what they need. They're going to be short a couple million cubic meters, and we haven't talked about India. So relative, whether it be in products or be raw logs, or a combination, I think all of the above still bode well for the timber business. Now here on the peninsula, I've got to tell you, we, we're, we grow a wonderful crop and things will continue to hopefully improve. We have a question about obviously state and federal lands. I, I've just kind of set aside the federal lands. I mean, they will do what they will, but not much. Hopefully the state will arrive at a sustained kind of level. Um, and as far as private lands, we can't actually produce very much more than what we're doing right now. So, um, things will happen with genetics and tree improvement and you know all the other things that occur. But yeah, we'll get more supply, but a lot more supply not going to happen here. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, now relative to things, and you know I said in the cross laminated, laminated timber thing, I think that is has a great potential, and lots. Let's not forget that, but. I'll go back to where I was before. If you don't have a, a supply that you're certain of, you're not going to make that investment. Good luck going to any kind of board and, and getting approval of that. So. So. Thank you. I have a, um, I actually have a follow-up okay. question. I don't mind. Okay, so uh, we, one of the questions was, uh, let's see, do you have enough time available available for port meetings and other community obligations? Um, and you talked about how you you have a lot of commitments through June. Right. Um, and you know that there are four Mondays between now and June when you won't be available. Um, well, one of my questions were, were those Mondays on commission dates? Or were they in between? I, I can't answer that because okay. I don't know. One, one, in one period, I'm gone two weeks. Okay. So I'm sure one of the two would occur. In the other ways, and, and again, teleconference, is that possible? It certainly is, but on the East Coast that one time, I just, I just know where I'm traveling. You don't even have cell coverage part of the places where I am. So, you know, okay. I, it's just, it's just well, you know. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, I, I will say it again. 
if, if you know my background, if I get real involved with things or, or have a whole lot of questions, I send them to people so you know what my thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent, but you'll mm -hmm. at least know where I'm coming from that. Mm -hmm. And I'll spend time with the people involved in whatever the issue may be. So I understand it, number one. Number two, if I have a need to weigh in on something, I certainly will do mm -hmm. that. So, mm -hmm. um, We've had flexibility at the port here where we moved meetings around to accommodate a commissioner schedule. So that would be a possibility. Um, but so I guess. What I really want to know is how much time would you have available between now and June to spend on court activities, and then how much time would you have after that? How much time can you commit on a weekly basis? Well, I, you should know in my prior work life, you know, it was in a 40 or 60 hour week that I worked a whole lot of times, uh, and so it's time's a relative thing. If, if I need to put in the time, I'll put in the time, whatever it takes. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not against taking things home and studying them and spending time on it because I do that. So I do that in my job now because it's required. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if I answered that very well, Colleen, but I, you know, I, I will put in whatever time it takes, there's no doubt. I just wanted everyone to be aware, and I've tried to highlight that, which is an issue, and I understand that. I just, I just am not flexible out of a few things. I just yeah. can't get around Well, that, we both so. have full-time jobs as well, so. No, I know that. I mean, you know, so. It's mm -hmm. a, um, okay, so here's my follow-up question. Okay. Please share your experience in evaluating risk in a contract. What's your philosophy in val evaluating risk versus a new opportunity and our mission to grow our economy? Um, first of all, I, uh, you, you know, this would be my prejudice, just so you understand. Uh, if I only listened to my attorneys, I would never do a deal. <laughs> but but that, that so, so you need to, because they're paid to point out all the risk in the world that we ever might have. And again, it doesn't make any sense. But most of the time, you know, uh, and I'll answer it in a couple ways. There, there's when you're looking at, at the risk. There's there's rate of return risk. Will I get X, Y, or Z? And, and we do sensitivity analysis. I think like like I'm sure you do here at the port, where you look at different rates and different you know assumptions and what those result in. So all those things are absolutely important, and you normally we you know a low, medium, high. What do I expect? Here's the range. Okay, that that's part of my rate of return kind of question. The B part are all those other ancillary factors, of course. And again, the legal staff is very good at it, and as are others. You know, is there environmental risk involved? Is there some kind of risk relative to either obsolescence or maybe the company won't be around after a period of time or whatever. You know, and, and part of it, that risk also involves what am I putting into the deal? You know, if I have to go put in, let's just say we had this wonderful tenant and it requires the port to put in a, a major amount of money to, to be on the waterfront, you're certainly going to have to look at the financial well-being of that entity, no matter what else you look at. I mean, you know, uh, if you look at a FOSS or maybe it's XYZ or whomever, it doesn't really matter. You need to take a close look at whom that tenant is, tenant is and what their track record is about everything else too. So, um, so am I willing to take risk? Obviously, well, I take risk all the time. Every everything you do is a risk, but you know, you need to certainly evaluate all those different factors. So. Thank you very much. I think that's it, unless you have a follow-up. I don't. Okay. Oh, you had one more. One more question that you were asking. Oh, I, that's right. Thank you. Would you at this point verbally commit to running again in 2017? At this point, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Okay, thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. let, let me, I did not okay. give you this, um, I haven't called all these people, but, and, and it may become important, but I wanted to just give you a quick list of, of people that I've been involved in, with in, in this area relative to business. Okay. And so you look at all these people, including, you know, uh, uh, say, uh, you know, it could be Don Butler, High Energy Metals, 
company you don't know much about, you know, bang and merge metals together and everything else. Well, why would I get involved with them? Because they were, when they first started, didn't have a, uh, an ability to continue in business if they didn't have someplace to go explode a lot of, have a high explosion of merged metals together out and about because they're located in Squim. Uh, but please call him, you'll get whatever. Okay. And then I put down people like, heaven forbid, why would I put down Steve Theringer or Derek Kilmer? Well, you have to be involved in all kinds of things. You can talk to, to Derek. He was a great help on a couple of issues. Number one, <laughs> Workforce training, when we had some issues here, very important. Of equal import, import, and sometimes people forget about this, you have to think about all levels of where, you, what, where you're doing business, export, import, bank. Everyone thinks, oh, well, that, we're just talking about Boeing. No, no, no. We're talking about the government helping us to finance exports when we, when we go someplace, and that's a big help. And, and as you may or may not know, he as well as a lot of R's, ND's, all got together and, mm -hmm. and actually made Congress work the way it should work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and that's just the, an example of things that you need to be involved in when you're in business to make things happen. Okay. So, okay? Wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. We're asking each of the candidates that we didn't disclose beforehand. So. Uh, anyway, Connie will ask. The Before you get started, yes. let me apologize. Randall Johnson. For um, when I submitted the application, I was switching my computer from Windows 8.1 to 10. And when that happened, it was when I was putting everything together. So you notice I was my illegible handwriting came into play because I just could get it right over the weekend. So, yes. so yeah, I just want to state that I'm, I'm normally a little bit better off and a little more computer literate than that. However, uh, <laughs> that things like that happen. So, okay, uh, okay. Yep, they do. sorry. Uh, well, and the questions we're going to ask too, we have to ask of everyone. So even if yes. you include some of these answers in your five minute. Um, when we first began, and uh, I've been involved, obviously, in the Economic Development Council and many other nonprofit kinds of entities, including the Chamber of Commerce, on and on. And all of it relates to another story. You know, kids, when they graduate from high school here, they say, gosh, I'm going to go away to college and I'll never come back. I'm looking at someone I know who has come back, but that's beside the point. Um, and that's great. And then about age 30 or 35, they say, oh, I'd like to come back. What kinds of jobs do we have here? And guess what? You know, we're lacking jobs of certain types that, that we have. And the job is not just the job, it's also the job for the significant other that comes with it. So we are missing that kind of, of, uh, of uh, activity relative to the jobs. And that's always been very important. Um, so I and I, so again, I cared about the economic health and the vitality of our area. Um, the port commissioner job is a valuable part of this equation because it's able to leverage port assets. I and you will see um, later, and I've certainly put my letter. Uh, a deep water harbor with waterfront. There just aren't many places like that in the whole state, and for that matter, the whole country, any place. And that just has to rise right to the tip top of one of the things we have. And there are a lot of other port assets. Of equal importance, I, I think, uh, obviously, you have an executive director here and, and the whole staff all working together. And I will say again, you know, and I, you have seen the question to you as we go through the list. Right. So um, number one would be, what would be your message if you were out on the campaign trail? And if you could let us know in five minutes or less. In five minutes or less. Mm -hmm. Okay, I w we'll try in five minutes or less. First of all, some people have come back to me and said, are you crazy to even look at that? And then I thought about it and I thought, let me see, I just came from a meeting today dealing with SARC and the YMCA, and one would probably argue that maybe that was also a crazy thing. So one has to care about the community, first of all, and that's probably the most important thing. I mean, why else would I be involved in things like that? At least that's my feeling anyway. I've been and have cared about economic development here on the North Peninsula ever since I was here, which was 30 years ago.
Well, thank you for interviewing us. <laughs> follow-up question from your written comments or your, your written answers, the supplemental questions or the uh, answers that you provide today and then we each have one question 